name is Carol Mankiti, and I'm the wife of Ifani Mankiti, who passed away a few years ago, but who bought the store from uh, Louisa Solano, who sadly passed away just a few, few days ago. So it's, there's kind of a sadness about that, but yet a, a real tribute to her, because she was an amazing person who owned the store for 35 years as a single woman and really built up the poetry community in Cambridge. So. But now my children and I, since my husband's death almost three years ago, own the store. <laughs> and so we want to keep it and keep advancing it and with the help of James and his assistant Fiona. Things are really good. So we're happy about that. And I just want to thank them as well. So um, we feel it's a very sacred place. We love it very much and I think Many people all over the world love it. So thank you for coming. And thank you to those of you who are in Zoom for being here with us for a wonderful meeting, I'm sure. I Can't Talk About the Trees Without the Blood, um, winner of the 2017 Agnes Lynch Star Prize and Equilibrium, selected by Alpha Michael Weaver for the 2016 Frost Place Chapel Competition. Clark is a winner for the, the, the 2020 Kate Tufts Discovery Award, a 2019 National Endowment for the Arts Literature Fellow, and the 2015 Rattle Poetry Prize. She's a recipient of the 2021 to 2022 Amy Lowell Poetry Traveling Scholarship and 2019 Pushcart Prize. Clark is the 2017 to 2018 JC and Ruth Hall's Poetry Fellow at the Wisconsin Institute of Creative Writing. Her, her writing has appeared in or is forthcoming from The New Yorker, Poetry Magazine, The Atlantic, The Washington Post, Virginia Quarterly Review, Tin House Online, Kenyon Review, BuzzFeed News, American Poetry Review, Oxford American, The Best American Poetry 2022, and elsewhere. She is the Grace Hazard Conkling Writer in Residence at Smith College. In her poem, My Therapist Wants to Know About My Relationship to Work, Tiana Clark writes, All day like this, I shorten my breath, my head bent down, but not in prayer, heavy from the looking. When I read a Tiana Clark poem, each like a hand searching, gathering the pieces of us on the beach, I can't help but feel graciously ministered to and broken apart, taught to categorically bear witness to historical and daily injustice, to, li to listen attentively to one's ancestry and one's dead, but also to painfully fall in and out of love with the world as Clark leads her readers back to shore, the dream for wholeness held in her looking and her shuddering breath. Clark ends her poem with solace in how the self makes and is made. She ends with a return to love, care, and discovery despite the pressures and heavy burdens of the day. She writes, again, I child back, I float, I sing. Please join me in welcoming the wonderful poet, Tiana Clark. Um, it's so interesting because I think, you know, this book came out, um, I think it's come out, 2018. 
Um, so I still love reading from it, but it's all, uh, also that new book energy where you want to like live with a new book too. So I'm going to make space for both. Um, so I saw that um, uh, you might have done it, James posted that Phyllis Wheatley poem on Instagram this morning. So I thought I'd start with that, especially since Phyllis Wheatley has such a big connection to Boston. Um, and I was really drawn to her. Several women kind of haunted me in this collection, Phyllis Wheatley, Nina Simone, uh, Rihanna, all, you know, they all have something in common. <laughs> but um, Phyllis Wheatley in particular, I think being the first um, black female poet in America, um, and her autobiography just really struck me about how she was named after the ship um, that she was brought over, and she was brought by John and Susanna Wheatley, who had lost a child the year before, so I think they had kind of a tenderness, um, complicated tenderness in their heart for her. And so when they caught her kind of writing in coal, um, they didn't punish her. Um, so I felt really drawn to her to have this kind of like series where I was kind of talking to her um, in these poems. Conversation with Phyllis Wheatley, number one. Don't you hate your name? I was named like all things are named, after the things that carry them. Blacked out belly of my slave ship, the pitching womb of the ocean slapped against splintered and swollen wood. My only mother was born again, darkness slatted with sun and moonlight. There is no mercy before this one. How do you cry for a continent that you cannot smell? I had no ears or nose before the stench of damp and sour bodies chained with moaning, calling out in different tongues to different gods, all midnight babble. Small and unchained, I slipped through feverish thighs like a small, soft egg floating inside the scorching center of this moving hyphen. African American, dash, exposing the break. Um, so in this next one, um, conversation fills with number 14. I was really interested in the, the series of letters that I found between her and Ogor Tanner um, and the Massachusetts Historical Society. We only have Phyllis Wheatley's side of the letters. Ogor Tanner's doesn't exist, so of course, for me as a poet, I was like, I wanted to um, take on that persona of Ogor Tanner and write back to Phyllis Wheatley. Um, so it's interesting because Robert Hayden has a poem that he called a psychogram where he was writing as Phyllis Wheatley back to Ogor Tanner. Um, and so I adopt a lot of the double talk language. She's using a lot of this like religious, um, self-evident kind of language. And I'm I was wanting to kind of subvert that, because I think that she was definitely living out meanings. Um, and it's really interesting, because the only letters that we have from her where she's writing to another ins uh, uh, enslaved African. Uh, and so um, there's a scholar named Catherine Broussard. She kind of points that as the first kind of African-American writing community between two women in America, and so I kind of, I wanted to, to join them and travel back in time, but kind of, again, use this religious language uh, in kind of a piercing way. Recovered letter from Obor Tanner to Phyllis Wheatley in Boston, Newport, February 6, 1772. Dear sister, I am a savage. There is savage me inside, wild thick as sin, so much my soul is clabbered. But there is a change, I sense, inside my curdled mess. Christ hung and crucified in me, daily a saving change. The ship, do you feel the ship pitching sometimes inside the skin, under your skin, chanting as the Atlantic whispered, lulling us fluid as him and seamen and what languages we couldn't understand? Remember the ships that brought us over the bent world? Let us praise these wooden beasts that save the evil beast of us. Do you remember the ship, Phyllis? Do you remember rocking the rocking black milk like I do? Remember the bowels from the reek inside the deathly ship? There was nothing in us to recommend us to God except the bowels of divine love. Remember inky black, starless black, blue black with moaning, smelled like salt and salvation, God's skin hammered long nails like our breath bleeding. But we converted. We have been saved by a saving change. My heart is a true snow white heart of true holiness, pure as buttermilk, evangelical as buttermilk. But repentance can save our people from a land of seeming darkness and where the divine light of revelation being cloaked is as darkness. What was darker than the bowels of that ship you were named after? Do you remember, Phyllis, how black black is? The mold.
mold or send the trigger that mist was on everything, buzzing our damp little bodies with spores, encircling the air, emerald rust crawled and blossomed inside our lungs. It coughs and rackets the bright blood from us like a claw scraping, no, like soft applause from the balcony for the swarthy to sit upon during church, like when we met. I was a dozen broken roses, bruised as velvet English and reaching desire for you across the pews, across the vast empty spaces where two slaves who could read and write could touch each other there as women and call it praise. Let us marvel at the love and grace that bought and brought us here. Amen. Your very humble servant and friend, the Lord Canada. So I'll move from Phyllis Wheatley to Rebecca, because that's a natural transition. Um, so I really love acrostic poetry, poetry that's often visual art. And one of my favorite acrostic poems is from Rilke's Archaic Torso of Apollo, which ends, for here there is no place that does not see you, you must change your life. And so I always ask my students, what is that piece of art that you feel completely changed after? Is that like you're, you're going home and you're just like silent in the car? Um, and for me, I think when I did see Rihanna's music video, it utterly like changed every cell in my body. And I think for me, it was the first time that I saw a black woman um, have agency in her own retribution. And yes, the video is extremely violent, but I, I often didn't get to see that. The violence is often enacted upon black bodies and, and not in charge of it. And so I think for me, when I saw it, I was completely enthralled. Um, I remember submitting this poem into my workshop, and um, I made everyone watch the video before I made them workshop the poem. Um, <laughs> Because there was one person in the class that hadn't seen it, and I was like, this is required reading, or required viewing. So, BBHMM after watching the music video. I, too, want to be naked, zebra-striped, and the almost dried accountant's blood, sticky and sucking a fat blunt inside a Louis Vuitton suitcase brimming with the newest money. This is another way to see myself, too, and the way Brianna nooses a white woman up by her smooth, a blue blooded pendulum swaying as her beautiful tits look more perfect than ever. Why did that image excite me so? No, not the tits, but the simulated lynching. It feels so damn delicious to say, bitch, bitch better, bitch better have my money inside my mouth. I hate it when people talk about black artists being capitalists. Why can't we thrive in something rich and great too? And let us be loud about it. Let us be loud without consequence. I remember when we were dating, I wanted you to pay for every meal. And yes, the movies taught me that love was someone reaching for the check first. There is no such thing as a free lunch. Someone has to pay with the fruit from their body. Yeah, I'm spreading my legs for someone else because I'm hungry and always at the end of some kind of altar. Even now, I'm paying for my doctor to reach and scrape inside me to say I don't have cancer. She tells me I need to start thinking about babies because of my age. I think, bitch, I'm not ready. There will always be tithes and offerings. At my church, they called it first fruits. My mother gave me quarters, and as a kid, I waited for the clink at the bottom of the bucket being passed. I believe God heard this too. Somewhere, someone is counting the cash behind a velvet curtain. Once, a boy said, suck it, bitch, with his heavy, dense hand at the back of my head, pushing, pushing as another way to mean, pay me what you owe me. I didn't forget. Yeah, I see the total at the bottom of the receipt. I have so much debt. I am forever in the wettest red. I remember when I turned that poem also to my mentor. She was like, "This poem scares me." She was like, "You shouldn't, you shouldn't submit it." And I was like, "That's exactly what I'm doing." I think it's okay for art to scare you sometimes. So it's interesting when I was working on this book. Um, I remember, I think it was Ocean Bomb. I might have been another poet. There was this idea that I picked up somewhere that you should always maybe leave a little bit of a hint of the next book and the book that you're working on. And I didn't know it at the time, um, but I, these two next poems I'm going to read, I think, were starting to hint to what my next collection was going to be about even before I knew what it was about. There's a great quote by Audrey Merch that I'm going to mess up royally. So if you look it up and you say, like, oh, that was different than what kind of said, but I'm just owning that. But the quote is something like, um, poems are like dreams in that we put what we don't know what we know. And so I feel like, I don't know if y'all have had that moment where like, you start prophesying of yourself and like, you're like, oh, that's what I was uh, going through. And so the second book is starting to reveal some things that I think at the end of my first book, I was maybe not able to name fully, but I was starting to kind of concretize that abstraction around some 
wrong with a little bit of language. Midnight to 3 a.m. I glare at my husband snoring and think of a lot of house slaves. Not all of them, just the ones that might have looked like me and were petrified like me to touch themselves down there, downwards burnt and swollen, to worship that weak part of me that's cream, to hunger that part of me that's white matter separated. The forgotten phonics of blood thickening the room with red platelets. I close his mouth. I clap my hands. I turn him over to stop and start myself. Rituals, which begins with the epigraph from Stuart Dybeck, which reads, what does it matter? We've made not doing it a wonder. The most dangerous game for me is sex and syntax. Your hand is so familiar and terrifying as family reaches for my name and in my navel, which is a cup of hunger, always in that order, my hand drags after a loss, after some inexact pass. The wet mood lingers, erotic with the scent of a half-peeled orange, broken by a nasty thumbnail. The moment clicks and disappears again before we attempt release, this hardened honey, this slow drip of joy. Another spider approaches and then I smash it, smearing gorgeous little guts like black lotion, Strange how desire is greedy and silent in stasis. Strange how two bodies can grow without branches. And again, how do you diagram two broken bodies without parsing, without penetration? Is this still what I want? Another year, another sip of good bourbon, neat and decadent. Something like a lock of latches. Another hard world approaches without water. Another hard world approaches without fur. Another hard world approaches and approaches without punctuation, enters without sucking salt from these two bodies, starved and pulsating on the brink of so much touching and not touching. I ache for grammar when it's bent and fluid. I ache for him, for her, and then for myself, always in that order, last and lust. I hum, I bang, I bite, I touch myself, my many selves. If I whimper, can I call it God? Oh God, please delay the verbs. Once in bed, you finally gave me what I wanted. I didn't want it anymore. The whipped cream slid from your cool nipples and strings of white tears. See, I'd already eaten so much sugar that day. I was so full and sick of it. Okay, all ready for the new, the newness? Mm -hmm. um, take a sip of water. Um, I once made a diorama from a shoebox for a man I loved. I was never a crafty person, but found tiny items at an art store and did my best to display the beginning bud of our little love. A scene recreating our first kiss in his basement apartment, origin story of an eight-year marriage. In the dollhouse section, I bought a small ceiling fan, recreated his black leather couch, even found minuscule soda cans for the cardboard counters that I cut and glued. People get weird about divorce, think it's contagious, think it dirty. I don't need to make it holy, but it purifies. It's clear. Sometimes the science is simple. Sometimes people love each other, but don't need each other anymore. Though I think the tenderness can stay if you want it to. I forgive and keep forgiving mostly myself. People still ask, what happened? I know you want a reason, a caution to avoid, but life rarely tumbles out a cheat sheet. Sometimes nobody is the monster. I keep seeing him for the first time at the restaurant off of West End where we met and worked and giggled at the microbes. I keep seeing his crooked smile and open server book fanned with cash before we would discover and enter another world and come back barreling to this one, astronauts for the better and for the worse but still spectacular as we burn back inside this atmosphere to live separate lives inside other shadow boxes we cannot see. I remember I said I hate you once when we were driving back to Nashville, our last long distance. I didn't mean it. I said it to hurt him, and it did. I regret that I was capable of causing pain. I think it's important to implicate the self. The knife shouldn't exit the cake clean. There is still some residue, some proof of puncture, some scars you graze to remember the risk. Self-portrait at divorce. 
um, there's like a little note after reading Stag Sleep Again and finally knowing what the hell Sharon Olds is writing about. <laughs> <laughs> The day my husband left, I accidentally set off the house alarm. The dog finally curled into my chest like a warm croissant of cream fur, and you have replaced the trash bug the trash bag for the last time and the recycling and I walked into your office and I wept and wept inside your pillow on your bed oops I mean my bed a California king our biggest bed yet because we wanted space for our long bodies to stretch and room for the dog display and I put water in the dog bowl and I told myself that I had to remember to do that because you had always done that simple task and you often reminded me to do it when I forgot, and I didn't want our dog to die of thirst, and you left a cup of water on the end table by the couch we had picked out the year before. We had just walked into an Ashley Furniture store on a Saturday and sat on the first fake living room set, and we said, this is us, like we knew what we wanted, but we did that day, we did, and it was easy, which is rare for us. And I put your last cup of water to my mouth, and I guessed where your mouth might have been on the rim, and I pressed my lips to the glass, you always said I had the nicest lips, like two pillows, you said. And I kissed the cup and poured out the rest of the water into the sink, and it wasn't an offering to anything. And I put the cup in the dishwasher, and I started to tremble, and the house seemed, smelled like it was a train, but it was just the actual train that rumbles behind our house, I mean my house, and you called and told me you went to the hospital for chest pains, and I wasn't with you at the walk-in clinic, but you said I was still your emergency contact, and I slept on the couch that night because I didn't want to sleep in our, I mean my, big bed, and I wanted to grovel my way back to the complacency of us, and I wanted to grasp at the stomach of anyone, and I wanted the almost happy home we had, and I wanted to end the poem of gladness instead of the sound of the knife drawer opening and closing, opening and closing, music of metals and cabinet wood jingle, and the clink of steel blades and measuring spoons rustling against their edges and contours, and I didn't harm myself because I didn't want to harm myself. I wanted I wanted to feel the negotiation of pain besides the present pain. And I wanted the body's paint to come, but I didn't do it, okay? I just thought about it, and I think I'm proud of myself today for sitting down inside the empty well of grief and looking up. I always forget to look up. And I keep walking into each room, staring at the objects that we've brought together. Remembering fights at Target, laughter at Target, splitting up and conquering a to-do list at Target, and those little zapper guns they gave us at Target when we registered for our wedding gifts. And I haven't showered in days. I have a sourness to me and the lids of my eyes are swollen like tiny beige water balloons from all the sobbing. And I didn't do it, okay? I didn't. And I still want joy at the end. But the day my husband moved out, it felt like the first real day of fall, because it was. I like the way Josh says black love is radical. Tonight, I went to the park again, because I couldn't stop crying. I don't remember my dreams, and when I do, someone is always dying. Someone is always grabbing my arm when I wake up. Once, I woke to my own bite marks on my bicep. Tonight, my friend Josh said he did not exist in his own romantic imagination, and I felt a zap of acknowledgement dip through my chest like a tiny black bat, skittering the delicate lake for little bugs. Tonight, I wanted to ask a better question but couldn't, so I told Josh why I wanted to live instead. Tonight, wherever the sun sets, smeared the pink ghost in the sky from dust to dust and other kinds of dreamy darknesses. Tonight, I'll probably call my ex-husband and say nothing and hang up. I'll open the fridge and say nothing too. I'll take one more bite of tiramisu. What a delightful word. I kind of have to sing to say it. But sure, there you not to. It's like, tiramisu. <laughs> <laughs> it's like a Pokemon character. <laughs> I stared at a corner. I never thought I would write a bird poem, but it was the pandemic and this one just kind of spilled out my bed. I stared at a corner with its waterlogged wings spread open, drying off on a rock in the middle of a man made lake after diving for food. And it makes me think about wonder, and it makes me want to pry and stretch my shy arms open to the subtle summer wind slicing through the park, sliding over my skin, like a stream of people blowing candles out over my feathery body. And it makes me think about my church when I was a kid and how I lifted my hands to Jesus, hoping for surrender, but often felt nothing. 
except for the rush of fervent people wanting to be delivered from their aching present pain, and how that ache changed the smell in the room to money, and how I pinched my face, especially my eyes tighter, tighter, and reached my hands higher, how I, like the cormorant, stood in the middle of the sanctuary so exposed and open and wanted and wanted so much to grasp the electric brother rushing through the drama of it all, like a shout in the believer's scratchy throat. I don't go to church anymore, but today I woke up early and meditated. I closed my eyes and focused on a fake seed in my hand and put my hands over my heart to shove the intention inside my chest to blossom. I'm still stumbling through this life hoping for anyone or something to save me. I'm still thinking about the cormorant who disappeared when I was writing this poem. I was just looking down and finishing a line, and then I look back up. Gone. This will be my last poem. The terror of new love. With an exclamation point. For G. I thought about taking a picture to capture what. I decided to live through the present moment instead. Ephemeral glaze, sentimental risk, with the numb tips of our chilled noses grazing as we kiss and kiss. The deep droning whir of the ferry boat floating over Casco Bay, sailing away from the fringe of Portland, Maine. It's inside the small, silent slices of time, right? The terror of new love. The sun stung ripples which made our eyes drift, refracting and whiting out the landscape to bright cream as we approached Peaks Island. Who lives there? We wondered and imagined as we gasped at the pristine houses with massive windows perched along the periphery. Talkless minutes dotted with intermittent seagulls squawking overhead cold crunch of November air, gentle foam frothing and trailing the stern. It was almost sunset when I leaned back, softened and nestled deep in the camber of your embrace, your chest another miracle of comfort, your arms another possible home. I wasn't worried about being too much of myself yet, and love again, the first time since the damage of my divorce. It was gradual, subtly somatic, without the anxiety attached. You slipped in like a beloved book or a special knickknack that had always been there, but somehow I'm just now seeing it on the shelf stacked and floating in the part of my heart I'm trying to keep a jar of bikino warm. This it, or itness, a gentleness, a personal dispersal, not of light, but a fresh, odd, familiar feeling. This bluing calmness, not totally erasing the old fears, but welcoming the chance to try again be Thank you for the beautiful reading. Uh, we have time for a couple questions. I have one to start off, which is, uh, can you tell us a little more about your next collection? Um. <laughs> Yeah, I'll, I'll talk a little bit about it. It's hard because it's not officially like out, out, so it still feels, I'm in a like, superstitious land. Yeah. I will say um, that uh, if it's not obvious, I'm, I guess, writing, <laughs> the speaker is writing through themes of divorce. Um, <laughs> <laughs> so, um, uh, I don't know. Yeah, but I think, obviously, when you go through a certain kind of trauma, it takes time, right, to go through that. And so um, I think when I wrote my first collection, I was very much a man of fame. It was very, it was very autobiographical, and it was so wonderful. But then I would be out on tour, I'd be reading, um, and it had so much uh, black trauma in it. And then I'd go back to my hotel room, and I would be like, so um, I felt so broken. And so I knew that whatever I wanted the second book to be, I was like, I need to write some poems that can sustain some joy and su sustain myself, because um, I always say I'm writing to save my own life first. And so. Those poems were very important for me to, to write and bear witness to, but I think the next collection, um, I was thinking about, is it possible to transcend pain? And I, I don't know if it's possible, but I was at least wanting the second book, like a trapeze artist, to like reach for more for joy, or reach for the, or braid the grief with the gratitude. And so even though if I was gonna write about difficult themes, um, I one, wanted to implicate myself, and I also wanted to find these entry points where I wasn't kind of bloodletting in someone else's life, but maybe finding these little pockets of comfort within the discomfort or slices of joy and, and hold on to that. 
um, a little, and not to shoehorn it or toxic positivity, but but actually, what I tell my students is how do you how do you that keep that Keats idea of negative capabilities that like these these things that are seemingly opposite, how do we hold them together in a poem when they don't make sense, right? Um, and not that every poem has to do that, but I think that that was a scaffolding that I had in this next collection um, that I was really wanting to revel in pleasure um, and joy. And, and, so, um, and also some wildness. I also think when you go through an MFA, you have so many voices and mentors in your head, and it's beautiful, but it's also very intense. And so I think I had a long fallow period. So this next book is very much on my own. I, I haven't really shared it. I don't actually think with anybody. Um, and that feels like scary and exciting. Um, so I feel like I'm taking some risks. Um, but I, I, I always want to be pushing myself in that way. So yeah, that's, stay tuned. Yeah. <laughs> but thank you for asking about it. I'm excited to share it when it can be all official. Yeah. Um, something I was I'm always really very interested in sound and how the verbal affects a poem. And when you read your poem after the divorce, mm -hmm. you even said, "I have to take a breath <laughs> before doing this." Mm -hmm. And I was thinking very much of the pacing mm -hmm. and the speed with which you read that and. I was inferring that, okay, there's maybe a lack of punctuation. It sounds like a run-on sentence yeah. to kind of imply that. But I was wondering, what, what, kind, what do you do to imply how you want a poem to be read yeah. in a case like that yeah. or anything else across your yeah. Thank you for your question. It's so beautiful. Um, I, think, I think on a micro level, it comes down to line breaks. I think line breaks are like sheet music for your readers, right? And you're right. Um, you heard it, but that poem does have no punctuation. Um, and I think with this next book, I was interested in really long poems, and I, w I was really interested in chasing a type of breathlessness on the page. Um, after 2016, I felt really small in the world, and I remember listening to the Commonplace podcast with Rachel Zucker, and she was interviewing Roger Reeves and Ali Diaz, and Roger was talking about how he found himself in his life that when a white woman would pass him, he would kind of like subconsciously move out of the way, like, and still uphold this horrific social moray. Um, and that he asked himself, where was he doing that on the page? And when he said that, I like, almost veered off the road, because I was like, where am I making myself small on the page? Um, and it, almost, it feels audacious to write a long poem, right, to take up that much space. And so I feel like I really wanted to invest in that type of audacity. Um, with that particular poem, too, um, uh, and especially when I think of Sharon Olds' work, I think, you know, she has these muscular strokes that are just, they feel like they're just like these big, mighty breaths. Um, but that poem did kind of like rumble out of me. Um, I think Bruce Stone talked about that, like a poem would come rumbling down the mountain and she felt like she would like grab a pen, just, just like chase it. And some poems kind of, um, you know, uh, throttle you like that. And so I'm really interested in how on the page, kind of, and for the reader, either orally or visually, how can that poem be mimetic to that emotional experience? And so I think poems are patterns of our breath, right? And then, on the page, as it's rumbling through me, it almost, I, those, that very first draft for me is a very like messy draft. I'm just trying to hogtie that thing. I'm not, the editor's not there. But I think in revision, I realized I wanted to keep that messiness. And so I've been thinking about that too in my next question. What are the politics of being messy and, and, and poetry? Um, so I think mess and risk at sanitize and workshop. And I think that's something that's really hard to defend when you're a graduate student that I was trying to articulate that I'm just not able to put language to. And so I think in that poem, I wanted it to be messy. I wanted it to feel like I was running out of breath and that I couldn't contain other things. And if I slowed down, I wouldn't be able to even communicate these things to you, right? Like if you have that thing with a friend where you're just like on the phone and you're just like, you have to like get it out of you because you've had a big fight or you've had something happen. So I was interested in the poem reminding in that process. And so yeah, the lack of punctuation and like, you know, even where you have a jam it, where that can kind of mess with your speed and your syntax and your surprise. I'm really interested in modulating all those things on a craft level in the poem. And some of the things are just intuitive, right? You have those intuitive impulses mm -hmm. that you're just trying to follow. Um, so, yeah, I was definitely trying to chase a sense of breathlessness in the poem. Absolutely. Thank you so much. Yeah, thank you. Yeah. Yeah. Going off of that poem, I've also heard you read My Therapist mm -hmm. Needs to Talk About My Relationship with Work. Mm -hmm. And that also has that breathlessness mm -hmm. to it. So I wanted to know for you, do you see these two different experiences as, um, let me catch my breath. Yeah, yeah. So for these two different poems, which you have one, which is talking about your personal life and your work life, and then you have your love life and the breaking of that. And coming together, there are these two poems that just 
cut through you and there's that rambling of recklessness to it. How do you reconcile those two different situations? And how do they express themselves similarly on the page even though they can be removed from each other? Yeah, good question. Um, what I'll just say about the, I was gonna read it because you mentioned it, but I didn't have the poem in my bag because I think it, but um, thank you for mentioning the poem. Um, that particular poem is interesting because I start with that process and then the poem kind of slows down because I was, at the reader starting to take care of themselves and there's like a bubble bath and John Coltrane and stuff. I actually wanted the reader to experience that rush and then experience that like, okay, we're mellowing, we're chilling out in the poem. So I think though, um, in juxtaposing those two poems, for me, every poem is a world in which I like create and destroy. And so for me, like every poem reveals itself to me and what it wants to do. Um, so I'm very much like in the world of that poem as I'm creating it and maybe not even thinking. And again, some of these things only happen in the macro stage once you're starting to put a book together. And you, I bought the floor stage, you put all of your poems on the floor. And you're like, you see how they're starting to talk to each other and you see these themes. And actually, it's like you're revealing yourself to yourself. You're like, damn, okay, wow, there's, <laughs> there's some connections here that I didn't see were happening. Mm -hmm. But I think your poems are always kind of telling on you and they're talking behind your back and they're doing these things that you're like I just, I, actually it's, it feels like I'm catching up to my what I'm doing in my work if anything um, so actually it's interesting that you put those two poems together because I actually think those poems are talking to each other in that sense of going off of the breath of like um, how does anxiety display in the body I always say poems are bodies that remind us of our bodies and so I think in that poem that's dealing with anxiety and then one dealing with like maybe the trauma of divorce and, and, and mental health or maybe even circling around self-harm, that all was really connected mm -hmm. there. And so I think, um, for me, um, I think I also heard it from long ago, it's like everything I write is a part of the same tree, right? Mm -hmm. um, or Jack Spicer, like we're all writing the same damn poem over and over again. But just giving ourselves permission, like on the big river, like there's this little eddy, a little tributary, and then we go back to the big river, right? Um, and so I, I guess if anything, I've given myself permission that it's okay to like recycle images or themes uh, and for myself, but how am I still making it new? Mm -hmm. yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Um, piggybacking on that a little bit, um, you mentioned just now uh, paying attention to like how, how the reader was uh, participating in the poem mm -hmm. itself, and then there was sort of that like I don't know if parse poetic is the right word, but when you were saying like I didn't want this, or I wanted this poem to end in like a joyful note. Mm. Uh, I was struck by that, and I was curious if you had any sort of like personal approach to like your own way of conversing with the reader in your poetry. Like, do you have a go-to for that or a way? Yeah, I'm really excited because um, I love <laughs> work, I love work wall breaks and poems, and so I, I mean you could maybe see them as like meta asides or you know ars poetica, but I can, I call them these kind of like poetic work wall breaks, and so. For me, like what happens like when we're watching Fleabag or Ferris Bueller's Day Off, and that idea when the actor turns to the screen or in the play, like you become a part of the play. Like um, to me, it creates urgency, immediacy, and intimacy, and that's what I want with my readers. Like I want to have an intimate relationship with my readers, and I like also having different entry points like into the poem process. So it's like there's a poem, then there's me writing the poem, and then there's the also the artifice of like the reader reading, me watching, me writing the poem. Jerry Capron has this amazing poem, and I'm gonna forget the title, maybe it's called Again. But it's a poem that deals with uh, the speaker's like parents' domestic violence, and the poem just starts like, here, like, here I go again, like another another poet like talking about their father, like another poet, and the, and the whole poem is just like breaks the whole entire time, it breaks all throughout. But it was almost as if the speaker had to have those breaks to even write the poem. Um, and so for me, I love inviting myself to do that. I think Ross Gay is another poet that does that really well. He's a great poem with feet. He's like, do you really think I'm talking about my feet? Of course she's dead. Her name was Tina. She died of leukemia. And the poem instantly shifts. Mm -hmm. But he was talking about his feet for almost like a page and a half. <laughs> but it was a stalling tactic that we all do with grief, right? Because we don't want to talk about it. And so the poem, again, reenacts what actually happens in our lives. And it's a really brilliant example of like what I love to do about poems, you know? Um, and, and the rest of the poem, Ross Gay says, like, He's like, I love it when a poet says, I'm trying to do this, or I'm trying to do that. He's like, sometimes it's a horseshit trick, but sometimes it's a way in which, like, the poet's trying to communicate with the reader. For me, um, Major Jackson just had a new poem that came out where he was like, reader, I wish I would have married you sooner. And that line just, like, hit me, because I was like, I think I did have a little bit of an adversarial relationship to my readers, because I'm like, I don't know, like, I, and maybe I didn't, like, trust them. 
But I think I'm in this like dreamy, maybe wooing stage now where like, I, I, for me, I think I do those fourth wall breaks a little bit out of an awkward sense of I'm wanting to feel less alone. Like I think we all go to literature to feel less alone in the world. And I think I do those breaks of like, are you with me? Like I'm saying something difficult, can you hold my hand here? Um, and so I think I do those moments as a way actually to like kind of like maybe even breach that boundary, you know, with my reader. So thank you for that question. Yeah. Um, I've been like moving through like five different questions and trying to figure out which one to ask. But um, do you feel like the like I don't know what your schedule your schedule has been like in terms of like going out and reading to people, but do you feel like how that shifted has impacted like the way in which you're writing and that sense mm -hmm. of intimacy or lack thereof mm -hmm. between like you and the reader or the person in the room? It's so interesting. Yeah, it was so you know, when March twenty twenty was happening, I had, all, I had all these dates booked out and they were like slowly like, you know, break, you know, can't be cancelled. And at first I was like it was like a little bit like, um, of course it was a time of like terror and like uncertainty, um, kind of still is, but, um, and then these like Zoom readings started popping up. I was like, what are these Zoom, like what? Like all these Zoom readings everywhere. <laughs> and I remember, doing, and I said no for actually the first kind of quarter of the, because I, I just felt, I was just in a weird state and I didn't, I was, I was also like getting uh, divorced on Zoom. So I was just in this like, mm. um, like I had this, and for Zoom was so weird to me because it was like this, presence of absence is absence of presence and like we're there, we're not there and I but then when it was like gonna be the how we were gonna help be, I was like, okay, let me start saying yes, um, and doing some of these readings. And it was very awkward at first because I was so used to having this interaction with the audience. It was so palpable or like hearing this, especially when you read poem and you hear this little tiny mm's or ahs or like those those are like little workshop notes for, for you. And it was so like silent. It was like the dead silence of Zoom. And it was like, you know, like, ugh. Um, I literally just would start saying my Zoom. I was like, please blow up the chat. I'm very like insecure. I need more love in the chat. I just like say what I needed. And then it just started, then I actually started getting really comfortable because it was like, I'd wear my pajama pants and then like a fancy top. And then it was just like, and then I, after the reading was over, I could just plop into bed with some like hot cocoa. It was like amazing. And I got like, I got, then I got like so too comfortable with it. And then when I started teaching, back um, at Smith, and that was my first time being back in the classroom. It was so weird. I think the first day I just like buffered for the first 30 minutes, and the students were buffering too. And I remember like, I don't even know if I was like talking fully and complete sentences, and it was also weird because everyone had masks on, and it was just their eyeballs, and I didn't know how to look at people again outside of like the windows. And then I had my first reading at Smith, and it was totally weird because I was like, oh, audience, microphone, like real time, and it was very like surreal and dreamy, and I'm still slowly getting back into it. I haven't done a lot. Um, and I find myself, like, it's one, it's also awkward to look at people in the eyes in general, um, unless you're, like, forced to in a camp setting. Um, no, but you can look at me now. But, but, but um, I think I got, in Zoom, you kind of had to look at, it was comfortable to look at people because they couldn't really see you looking back at you, but in, when you're in real life, I actually don't know what I'm saying right now, I'm just, this is all real life time, you processing it. This is what it's happening. <laughs> And you're on Zoom right now. Yeah, that's true, yeah. yeah. And I think it's cool that there can be hybrid events. Also, I thought it was such a great boon for, there were so many events that I could go to or see, like, mm -hmm. dream readings that, like, I never would able to get to see. Um, so it was, a, you know, I call the dark gifts of the pandemic where, you know, I got to read with people dream readings scenarios that were so fabulous. So I guess I'm still negotiating it, but I think in terms of how it relates back to the reader and my work, what's interesting is I did a, a workshop completely on Zoom for a program that I teach over the summer and I was worried how it was going to go, but they were actually, they took more risks in their work that summer because I feel like they were more comfortable being at home. And so that was really interesting to me that I think Zoom provided this like weird kind of comfort for people to get more real because they were in the comfort of their home. So yeah, and maybe in, in some ways it allowed me to do that as well, to process kind of my, my grief in a, in a more like private space or maybe read things that I would be more like, um, have more courage to do because sometimes when you go to these readings, you don't know who's going to be the audience, you don't know what kind of room it's going to be, if it's hostile or if they're, you know, or whatever. But I think on Zoom, you can't totally see the audience, so I felt more comfortable sharing the work. Yeah, thank you for your question. Yeah, no, totally. Oh, I sorry, can I just ask a really quick follow up? It's about um, whether, like, the tone of the poetry was going in this direction before the pandemic, where you feel like it kind of mm. made this, like, shift in how you're writing, like, the curve. That's interesting. It's hard for me to um, 
like pluck out because I was also getting divorced while the pandemic was like happening. So it's like, I think we all had intersecting traumas that were all like interwoven into that time. So it's hard to say like what came first, like what trauma, the chicken with egg trauma came first, I don't know. Um, I had been thinking about the tone of self-implication after a poem that I wrote in my first book called Soil Horizon, where I wrote about my ex and was wanting to take a picture at the plantation. And it was the first time I had written a poem about family or the people in my life. And it's uh, it's always a big question, you know, you get in creative nonfiction or in poetry with your students, like, how do you write about your family? Uh, and I still don't know. Um, but after writing that poem and some fallout that came from that, I, that was a note for myself in the second book, that tone of like, if I do write about people in my life, I want to make sure that I implicate myself, and I want to make sure that if I decide to, I want to take time and do that in a way that's really thoughtful and meaningful. Um, maybe there's some poems that I just keep for me, um, and what's that decision to put it out into the world? And so I think I've been thinking about that a little bit more clearly with the second collection. Yeah, Thank you all for these really wonderful questions. Yeah. Uh, just real quick. Um, I work with a lot of children, and I always find sometimes that their questions, as basic as they are, are a lot of fun to answer and can really kind of uh, expand upon. So I'm going to channel my inner child real quick. And yeah. what's your favorite part about writing poetry? Oh, okay. <laughs> um, no, I love it. I think for me, when there's that moment where I've written something that explains something that's been very confusing to me about myself, where I have that moment, I'm like, oh, like. I mean, I tell to my students a lot, like loss, grief, death, rage, lust. Um, like when we, there's, there's so many ways I say that language uh, fails us just as much as it saves us. And I think for me, what I love the most about poetry is that when I'm able to maybe not define it, but get closer to an explanation about these abstract feelings that we all go through, um, and I'm able to kind of bottle and shape that experience, and it feels so satisfying. It feels like that, that click or that like, oh, I didn't know I felt that way. Or a whole a whole poem um, can kind of give me just that like getting closer to those definitions that that kind of that translate life in a way that's like I don't know palatable and exciting and terrifying all at the same time yeah yeah. No, the, the childlike question is the one that's stumped me the most. Yeah. That's what I was saying. I get all the I'm time. Sorry. Adults ask questions, and all of a sudden a kid asks one. And you're just like, I know. I'm oh, like, man. why do I write poetry? <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's honestly something that I don't, I don't know if I could stop doing it. It's just like the way my mind works. If anything, it was it was it was actually a terrifying moment when I realized I wanted to be a poet. Is it the F train that goes out to Coney Island? Anyone know? So I um, I had an internship at the Schoenberg Center for Research in Black Culture. I wanted to be a historian. Um, but Langston Hughes is buried there, and then I feel like every day he was saying, like, hey, you're supposed to be a poet, and I was like, Langston, you're dead, please don't talk to me. <laughs> <laughs> but I was supposed to go to NYU for this, like, graduate history thingy, and I just took the F train all the way down Coney Island, I got a Nathan's hot dog, and I had a hot dog, and I was looking at the water, and I was like, shit, I'm, I think I'm supposed to be a poet. And I was, like, terrified. Um, but I knew I couldn't, I'll, I was doing all this research, and everything came out as poems, just how my brain works, that that's how everything was just cycled through me. It's just, just the way that... It's just my language to get through the world. There we go. We got. We got there. <laughs> Thank you again for the beautiful mm -hmm. reading. Let's give. <laughs> Do we have books for sale? Yeah. Oh, will we sign books? Uh, if everyone could please help move the chairs against the wall, I would, would be grateful. Thank you for coming. Mm -hmm.